Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. It's good to be with family on a holiday, right? And that's exactly what we're doing. <clears throat> I hope you've had a blessed morning, uh, regardless of what that morning has looked like. Some of you got to wake up to excited kids and opening presents and something like that. Uh, some of you were just with special loved ones, some, some family members, some friends. And I know some people were, were by ourselves this morning, but we were together with a lot of the thoughts that and memories that we cherish of our loved ones in times gone past. And, you know, regardless of what unique Christmas experience you had this morning, I truly believe and trust that all of them can be a very sacred experience, right? If we do these things, engage, whether it be with a lot of people or alone or with just a few, with God at the forefront, they are sacred, genuinely sacred experiences. And that's exactly why, we, why we're here this morning, right? To gather together and to be with God. You know, those of us who are literally here today, I know there are dozens who are watching online this morning. We come together, we stop from the toys, we stop from the, the nice breakfasts, we stop from the reminiscing and the storytelling to worship the God who has given us a reason to celebrate. Amen? Amen. That's exactly what we're doing. You know, it's easy to get so wrapped up in, in, all the, in all the good and fun things that are associated with Christmas morning, and we should absolutely in, enjoy all of that. But it's all pointless, it's all at least superficial, if we don't recognize the historical truth that comes about with this season, right? The historical truth that we reminisce on today, that God became flesh and dwelt among us to lead us out of the darkness and into the light, right? That God became flesh and dwelt among us to lead us out of the darkness and into the light. Now, of course, many people are quick to point out that Jesus was probably not born on December 25th, which is true. A lot of people like to point out that Christmas morning Sunday is no more important than any other Sunday in the year, which is also true. But I'm still going to wish you a Merry Christmas anyways, all right? That's, that's what you're getting from me today. You know, for one reason or another, our society has decided to celebrate, to focus on the birth of Christ this time each year. And so you bet that I'm going to celebrate that alongside. Because it's something worth celebrating, isn't it? This is absolutely something worth celebrating. All, you know, all religions, all religions, all great philosophies even, have a story, or maybe a couple of stories, that really turn out to be foundational for the very heart of that faith, okay? These core stories that prop up everything else. And if you ask me, Christianity has two of the best stories of any other religion out there. Two stories that no one else can compete with, if you ask me. And those two stories bookend the life of some carpenter from Israel 2,000 years ago, the man Jesus of Nazareth. That's the story, that story, that God became a human and that he died for our sins and also provided us a path out from the grave afterwards are the two stories that anchor not just the Christian faith, but everything in my life. I know many of your lives as well. You know, in, in all the other world religions, you, 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 you'll never experience anything quite like the person of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, to them, it, it, it's been said that Jesus, the, the person of Jesus, is a scandal to many of the other religions out there. You know, for many of the Western religions, the idea that God, who they view as this all-powerful, almighty thing, which we do too, it, it, it's demeaning, and it's, it's quite honestly, in their minds, a scandal that that wonderful, powerful God could fit into something as tangible and broken and vulnerable as a human body, and, and they reject that idea. Or for many of our Eastern religions, they, they view that, hey, God is in everything. So God is on, in me, God is in, in you, and so the idea of Jesus being God is, is fine. It's nothing special. In fact, to, for you to say that Jesus alone is God in the flesh is its own piece of heresy in their mind. You know, the incarnation of Jesus, the fact that God, the almighty creator of the universe, the sustainer of life, would empty himself, as Philippians 2 puts it, right? Would empty himself of his divine attributes and willingly join into the creation, not as the emperor king of the creation, or at least not in some obvious ways, but as a vulnerable baby. That's something worth worshiping. 
And, and knowing that in doing so, that, that in giving up so much to come into our messy world, that, that, would be, that gift would eventually be squandered, that it would be resented, that it would literally, at the end of it, be destroyed at great cost to him. And yet he did it anyway. He did it anyway because he knew the blessing it would truly be to, to you and I. You know, and that tells you everything you need to know about the God that I, I worship, the God that we worship here at the Centerville Church of Christ. You know, so this morning, I want us all to collectively join in a tradition that's been done for uh, generations. Some of you might have already done it this morning. I might be stepping on some dad's toes who are going to do it later today. But I want us all to stop and read the story from Luke chapter 2 of the birth of Christ, okay? People have been doing this from the very beginning. And even if you have done this this morning, and our family did, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to do it again, right? It's, it's the constant washing of, of uh, repetition that helps form our minds to what we want to focus on and the people we want to be. So Luke chapter 2, starting right here in verse 1, um, we read, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that was uh, taken place while Quirinus was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to uh, the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now this will be a sign unto you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Amen. You know, so this is my um, <clears throat> fifth time preaching the, the Christmas Sunday, okay? Whether that's Christmas Day, four days before, whatever. This is my fifth time preaching a Christmas uh, Sunday. And there's always this temptation to find some fresh insight, to find some, some original, unique piece of a classic story that you have all heard since you were small children because you were raised in the Western world. You've heard this every year since you were babies, right? And it's tempting to try to find something unique and special. And, you know, I've tried to do that in past lessons. I know a few years ago, one of my personal favorites on, on uh, the birth of Christ was talking about just the sheer chaos of this story. Okay, the shepherds, a bunch of pagan sorcerers coming to visit him, um, have being born in an antique or uh, ancient barn, just all of it uh, is chaotic. And we really put the mess in Messiah was, I think, the title of the sermon, right? Last year, I know we talked about the responses to this newborn Savior. These people who said, come, let us see him. How the shepherds responded with praise and worship. How the, the Magi responded with great travel and effort and gifts. And how Herod responded with rejection and fear and attempted destruction. Well, actual destruction, really. Um, and I remember the very first time, I was still a youth minister here. I preached on Christmas Eve. And uh, I took someone else's advice, and we preached on um, a good old gospel story. We didn't preach on the birth of Christ in anticipation of some possible visitors who might have ears to hear uh, just the good news in a classic form, and, and that was beneficial as well. And I have, I have other ideas, and in the future, hopefully you get to hear them, ideas on the faithfulness of Mary, the faithfulness of Joseph, 
Uh, the idea that this story begins off with Caesar, who literally called himself the son of God and the king of the world, exerting his power, all the while the real son of God and the real king of the world was giving up his power, right? There's so many good things here, and I hope that maybe recounting those can maybe give you some reflection later on in your day as you continue to, <clears throat> to praise God for this great gift. But I don't really want to do any of those today. I don't really want to preach any clever angles or anything good and original. Well, hopefully good, but not, not super original or unique. I'll take that back. You know, <clears throat> I don't really mind to be efforted to be insightful today. In fact, I, I want to say as little as possible this morning. Because I think the very best thing this morning that we can do is to hear that right there. The story we already read, the story you have heard before, the words of the Bible themselves sharing with us in simple, forward ways that God became a man and entered into our world to be like us, for us. That Christ, God himself, came forth from a virgin to be like us, for us. I just, I, I genuinely have no desire to try to spice up this story, okay? I mean, this is one of the most beautiful stories of all human history. Like I said, it's one of two, I think. The most beautiful stories in all human history. I, we, don't, we don't need to get clever with it, okay? You know, on that silent night in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago in a dark, grimy barn and a suffering yet faithful woman pushed into the world the very creator of that same world. And that, that, that's the story. That's, that's the insightful, clever thing. It's, it's just what it is. It's the incomprehensible, wonderful fact that God entered into his creation, that God chose to join us in our suffering, join us in the filth, enter into the darkness so that he could lead us towards the eternal light. And that, that's all it takes. That should, should be all it takes. Um, you know, and I got to say, uh, I've really been enjoying... Christmas music this year, the regular Christmas music, but specifically the Christmas hymns. And we did caroling on Wednesday, and I really appreciate the songs Jim has been leading us with this morning. Because, you know, while I'm trying to simply just ab absorb and sit with the glorious fact that God became man, I can really tell in the words of these hymnals that the ones who wrote it, they were doing the exact same thing. The content in these songs that we've been singing for hundreds of years are, are, are absolutely beautiful. I'm going to quote like three of them today. Your bulletin article has a, has a fourth one. Uh, but first, I want to start off with a song we sang, Hark the Herald Angel Sings. I love this, the, the, the poetic way it writes this. Um, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead, the Trinity C, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with us in flesh to dwell Jesus R. Emmanuel, and, and I appreciate Rich pointed out this morning, Emmanuel means God is with us, exactly, truly, literally, with us, not metaphorically with us, not just spiritually with us, literally, pleased to be with us as we are in a broken, fleshy world. That is who our God is. You know, and the message from the angels that they shared with these shepherds, which I love that too. And in the, the little devotional we were reading with the kids last night, it said like, Wouldn't it, don't, you, don't you think these angels, they showed up for all the kings and the rich, fancy people, right? I said, no. Showed up to a bunch of stinky, smelly shepherds, the, the real people who were looking for that real Messiah. That's who received the angel's message. And the angel's message, the words from the scripture we've already read just keep running through my head uh, in verses uh, 10 and 11. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Gospel, right? Good news. That will cause great joy for all, for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. To a bunch of people who had never received anything in their life, these shepherds. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And the world was literally the, never the same way again after these words, right? You know, the love of God, the love of God that motivated him to create, 
the love of God that motivated him to create a, a people that he could love, that he could pour himself into, that he could have a relationship with. That same love that motivated the very creation of this universe is the love that also motivated God to radically become a part of that creation, to be there with us and bring us back into his caring arms. And, and just the sheer radicalness, is, I think I already said the word, but of what's happening here. As someone who uh, has fathered three kids in the last like five years or something, to, a lot, okay, a lot in a short amount of time, you do not want to be a baby, okay? Any, any young parents of, of babies will tell you, it looks great, right? Because they're always sleeping and it looks really comfortable. You do not want to be a baby. You can't communicate what you need. The world is uncomfortable. And, and, and life is just, it, you can't do anything for yourself. Now, let me just take this a step farther. You do not want to be a baby in antiquity, okay? Without modern comfort, without modern medicine, without onesies, you do not want to be a baby in antiquity, right? Uh, you know how many, my kids go through like three ear infections a year, and I can't imagine what I would do without the antibiotics we have today. Now, imagine just like we, we don't want to do that. I mean, the, 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 the great sacrifice that would be to go back into a, a period of life where we're, we're covered in our own filth and we can't communicate our needs and we can't even hold things to ourselves. Now imagine you are the sovereign God of the universe whose very words create light. And to give up all that, to enter into a form where you can't even control your fingers, Right? What a sacrifice that truly is. It makes, it makes me think of these, these dramatic stories where parents enter, enter, parents enter into dangerous places to rescue their kids out of pain. These kind of horrifying news stories we read about, uh, like a parent who dives into a, a frozen pond because their child has just broken through the ice, right? Or parents who are willing to, to go out into a dangerous drug den because they know their son has, has gone too far and, and he's locked up in there and they're risking their lives to go and bring them back. Those are the kind of images or those are the kind of relatable stories that come to me when I reflect on Jesus becoming man for you and for, for me. Um, but I know at the same time the reality of that situation is that nothing my human mind can comprehend, no story I can come up with ever would really equate to the sacrifice God gave to enter into our fallen, broken world. Um, and that, that just motivates me to, to think about it more and to continue to reflect. <clears throat> and while the sacrifice of God is, is important to this, that's not the focus of the message, is it? Not the angels. When the angels show up to the, to, the, to the shepherds, they don't say, see what great cost God has paid to come to you. Instead, he's, it says, I, I bring you good news that will be great joy for all people. And when, you, when you're giving gifts this time of year, and you're giving gifts to someone you love, you don't necessarily want them to think about all the man hours you had to work to get the money to pay for that, do you? Or what, you know, the, the, the credit card bill you're going to get later. That's not why you give a gift, okay? You give a gift because you want that person to enjoy the good thing you have brought for them, okay? And, and the same is, is true of, of God. You know, he sent his son to dwell in our midst, not because he wanted to show off how far he's willing to go for you, though that is a great message and still should motivate us. He did it because he knew that it would bring us great life, full and abundant life now and for eternity. And, so that, and that's why we sing joy to the world, right, as we did this morning. Because now each and every one of us on this planet, we know, you and I here today, we know that we are not forsaken. We know that we are not abandoned. We know that we are not destined for the darkness. Instead, we have been given a gift of light. A gift of light that came in that child all those years ago. And we, we desperately need that message, don't we? We, we? Last week, right, we talked about how strong the darkness is in our world. Uh, but Jesus is the hope that we all need, and we talked about that last week. If God, could, if God could come and show us how the human life was supposed to be lived, if he could come and live the perfect life once and for all, if he would be willing then to take that perfect life and die in our place, then, then we could discover what it means to have eternal life. 
In other words, Jesus became a son of man so that we might become sons and daughters of God, right? He became a son of man so that we might become sons and daughters of God. And if that's not joy to the world, right, I, I don't know what is. And I, I, I distinctly remember last year, uh, we were going through a lot in our congregation. I remember walking out Christmas week with uh, <clears throat> the letters for the sign and put on our sign, the weary world rejoices. That's all it said. And I, I still to this day love that line. I, I was tempted to go and, and make that our, our sign again this week uh, as well. The weary world rejoices. A gift, a gift given to a weary soul, especially a gift of hope, can inspire rejoicing in even the most downtrodden, can it? The most downtrodden individual in this world if given an inspiring gift of hope, can be lifted up. And, and the people of God, the world as a whole, but especially the people of God 2,000 years ago, into the scene that Jesus entered into, man, they were, they were hanging their heads low. Okay? That was a suffering and wearisome time for the people of God, for the world at large. But the gift of God in this, in this small baby boy was all that they needed to lift their head and sing praises to God. And all they had to do was accept that gift, right? The shepherds did. They heard the message. They went. They went to Jesus. And they saw and they praised God. And they shared about what they had seen. These people who were living not a comfortable life were able to lift their heads and praise God because of this boy who had come uh, in such an underwhelming package. But had come to them and brought them such great joy. And I look around today. And I still see a weary world, right? But on days like today, and on, and on Sundays throughout the year, I see a weary world rejoicing. Because there are people who still experience the gift of that baby boy all these years later, right? You and I know what it is to live inspired, light-filled lives. Because there was a full manger in Bethlehem all those years ago. It's still a weary world, but we can gather together and rejoice in spite of that because God has walked in our shoes. He's walked in your shoes. He's walked in, in mine. He has felt your suffering. He has seen the highs and the lows of the human life. And now having lived with us, he invites us to come and to live with him. You need only to accept that gift. To, to take the invitation to join in his father's house, to live in his shoes and in his life for a while. And see, the gift that, that Mary wrapped, it's interesting, right? It was God's gift, but Mary, Mary wrapped it that, that night, wrapped in cheap cloth and, and laid in a manger all those years ago. It's still waiting to be brought home, to be placed in the heart and the home of so many people out there who would be so blessed by this gift from God. If that's you this morning, if you're ready to accept that gift, to have your life be changed through baptism, we invite you to do that now. Why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing.